Let's open our Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 44 and continue our look at the plans given by God to Ezekiel for the potential building of a temple for the Israelis upon their return from Babylonian exile. I've shared with you my belief that this should have happened but didn't, and therefore God's Holy Spirit did not come in power into the temple of Zerubbabel uh, because it had not been built according to these design plans uh, and the heart of the people was still caught up in sin and caught up in rebellion, which is shown uh, by the way that they lived uh, their lives in the generations uh, that followed. Uh, But this temple has a gate through which Ezekiel saw the Holy Spirit of God, the visible presence of God, return to the temple through. And something happens to that gate that is of significance. So Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 1. Then he, meaning the angelic guide, brought me back to the outer gate of the sanctuary which faces east. And it was shut. And he who is said to me, this gate shall remain shut. It shall not be opened, and no one shall enter by it. For he who is the God of Israel has entered by it. Therefore, it shall remain shut. So in the last part of the vision, chapter 43, Ezekiel saw God's visible presence go through this gate into the temple complex. And now that gate is shut permanently because God has no intention of going back out again. It's a permanent filling. That was the intention of God. And so this symbol of the permanently sealed gate is pointed out to Ezekiel. However, a gate is not just simply an opening through a wall with a door set in it. A gate is a building, actually, that you pass through as part of coming through the wall and through the door. And so it has places to sit inside the gate. And we know that in ancient times, prominent people sat as judges in gates to render uh, uh, their judicial judicial, uh, responses to petitions. And so we read here, only the prince may sit in it to eat bread before he who is. So this prince is Someone that is raised up, the word in Hebrew actually means that. It literally means someone raised up. Uh, So this person is raised up in order to be a leader to the people of Israel. He is not a king. That's interesting. Uh, The word king does not appear in the context uh, of leadership during this time period. Uh, But he, as the leader of Israel has the privilege of eating meals in this special gate area whenever he is worshiping God uh, on special days or any day that he comes. But because he can't go through the gate um, entrance, he has to come in by the way of the vestibule. Uh, He shall enter by way of the vestibule of the gate and shall go out by the same way. So he comes in from the west side and always leaves by the west side of this gate building. Verse 4. Then he brought me by way of the north gate to the front of the temple. Uh, The north gate, I think, keeps getting highlighted because in Ezekiel's day, before the destruction of the temple, Uh, It was in the area of the north gate that the Jewish kings and the rebel priests had set up an idolatrous image, uh, probably an Asherah. And uh, so it had been horribly defiled 
uh, by this action. But now in this perfect temple, this rebuilt temple of God's holy presence, the north gate is free of all that garbage, all of that, that contamination. And so uh, Ezekiel keeps being brought back by there so he can kind of notice, I think, there's nothing unclean in this spot anymore. So he brought me by way of the north gate to the front of the temple, so in the courtyard, and I looked and behold the glory of he who has filled the temple of he who is, and I fell on my face. So there's God's visible physical presence in the temple shrine building. Uh, this is the glory that he saw at the beginning of the book. Uh, the, the visible form of God seated upon a throne, which is on a crystal platform, which is above the heads of the four cherubim, the four-faced, four-winged angelic beings with their whirling wheels, wheels within wheels, all of that he sees in the temple building. And he shows proper, uh, proper worship toward God because of that. Verse 5, He who is said to me, Son of man, mark well, see with your eyes, hear with your ears all that I shall tell you concerning all the statutes of the temple of he who is and all its laws. So God tells Ezekiel, I need you to pay very close attention to all the rules that I'm giving you because I want you to pass it on to the Israelis so that they do things right in this new temple that they're supposed to build. Uh, verse number six, say to the rebellious house, to the house of Israel, thus says he who is God, O house of Israel, enough of all your abominations. So back to the idea, this is supposed to be the end of the sinning of the Israeli people. Once they've come back into the land, once they've rebuilt this temple, once God has entered into their presence, they're supposed to be holy as he is holy from here on out. So God is now challenging them through Ezekiel before that temple gets built. Get it taken care of. Leave this junk behind. Repent. So enough of all your abominations in admitting foreigners, so allowing non-believers into the temple, uncircumcised in heart and flesh to be in my sanctuary, profaning my temple. When you offer to me my food, the fat and the blood, you have broken my covenant in addition to all your abominations, and you've not kept charge of my holy things, but you have set others to keep my charge for you in my sanctuary." So God's going back over all of the stuff that they went into exile for. He wants that to not be happening once they come back and build this place. Verse 9, Thus says he who is God, No foreigner uncircumcised in heart and flesh of all the foreigners who are among the people of Israel shall enter my sanctuary. No Gentiles are supposed to go beyond the barrier. They're supposed to stay at a distance, even if they are there for worship. Verse 10, But the Levites who went far from me, going astray from me after their idols, when Israel went astray, shall bear their punishment. They shall be ministers in my sanctuary, having oversight at the gates of the temple and ministering in the temple. They shall slaughter the burnt offering and the sacrifice for the people, and they shall stand before the people to minister to them. Because they ministered to them before their alt idols and became a stumbling block of iniquity to the house of Israel, therefore I have sworn concerning them, declares he who is God, they shall bear their punishment. They shall not come near to me to serve me as priest, nor come near any of my holy things and the things that are most holy, but they shall bear their shame and the abominations they've committed." Yet I will appoint them to keep charge of the temple to do all its service and all that has been done in it. So if there are any survivors of these groups that when they were very much younger, they participated in the sinful activities, if they are part of the group that comes back and rebuilds the temple complex and, and reestablishes everything, even if they've repented, they are not going to be allowed to serve as 
priests offering sacrifices in the holy areas. They can still do all the other prep work, uh, and they can help the people, uh, but they are not going to come into the holy area of the shrine building or to the altar because they had voluntarily participated in sinful activities in their younger years. Verse 15, But the Levitical priests, the sons of Zadok, who kept the charge of my sanctuary when the people of Israel went astray from me, shall come near to me to minister to me. They shall stand before me to offer me the fat and blood, declares he who is God. So apparently there's this group of Zadokim, these descendants of Zadok that remain faithful right up to the end. And so God says any of those people are going to be allowed to continue coming into the holy area. They shall enter my sanctuary, they shall approach my table to minister to me, and they shall keep my charge. When they enter the gates of the inner court, they shall wear linen garments. They shall have nothing of wool on them when they minister at the gates of the inner court and within. So their utility uniform is going to be made of plant material, linen, no animal material, only plant material. They shall have linen turbans on their heads, linen undergarments around their waists. They shall not bind themselves with anything that causes sweat. So that's one of the, the distinctions, apparently. Linen is much cooler than wool garments, and so it doesn't cause as much overheating. Verse 19, When they go out into the outer court to the people, they shall put off the garments in which they've been ministering and lay them in the holy chambers. We actually saw this in the description of the inner court. There is a place... Uh, a barrier wall with rooms in it between the court where the priests do all their work and the worship court where the people are. And so we were told then, and now we're being told again, that when the priests transition from the inner court to the outer court, they have to take off their priestly uniform and leave it in the transition rooms and put on regular clothing, and then reverse that when they're coming back the other direction. Uh, They shall not shave their heads or let their locks grow long. They shall surely trim the hair of their heads. So they're also going to be moderate in the way they keep their hairstyle. The Jewish law forbade the complete shaving of the side of the head, uh, the sideburns and down into the mutton chop area of the beard. Uh, this was a pagan practice in the countries around them. It was, uh, it was tied into their gods and goddesses and the dead. So all Israelis were told not to shave the sides of their faces. But Uh, they were also not supposed to just let their hair grow long there, uh, totally untouched, which is quite ironic because the Hasidic Jews of modern time uh, actually let uh, the hairs of their head at that part, their sideburn uh, mutton chop area, just grow through the rest of their life till they have these great big long curls that hang down the sides of their their faces. Uh, But apparently here, uh, the rule that God was giving through Ezekiel is, you don't go to that extreme either. You're supposed to be moderate. Keep a nice trim on that side of your face. Verse number 21. No priest shall drink wine when he enters the inner court. Uh, This goes all the way back to the beginning of the priesthood, uh, and it may have tied in with why Aaron's two oldest boys were executed by God, uh, that they might have been drunk whenever they tried to offer strange fire, unauthorized fire. Uh, And uh, from then on, the priests were always reminded, when you're on duty, you don't drink. 
uh, verse number 22. They shall not marry a widow or a divorced woman, but only virgins of the offspring of the house of Israel or a widow who is the widow of a priest. So they are not to marry uh, widows unless they happen to be the widow of another priest that has passed away. And they are only supposed to be marrying virgins, if they're not a widow of a priest, uh, not divorcees or uh, uh, widows of, of the different tribes. So they are supposed to show their dedication to God even in their selection of a spouse. Verse 23, They shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the common, and show them how to distinguish between the unclean and the clean. So they're supposed to set an example. They're supposed to be uh, more responsible uh, than anyone else in the society. Uh, they sh- in dispute, they shall act as judges, and they shall judge in according uh, to my judgments. They shall keep my laws and my statutes in all my appointed priests, uh, feasts, and they shall keep my Sabbaths holy. So they are supposed to be the examples for everyone else. Uh, when they're uh, getting questions about the law, they're supposed to know the law inside and out and be able to guide people in it. And they're supposed to set the example for keeping those laws and set the example for keeping the appointed festivals in the proper way and keeping the Sabbath day. Verse 25, They shall not defile themselves by going near to a dead person. However, for father or mother, for son or daughter, for brother or unmarried sister, they may defile themselves. The priests that are on duty are not even supposed to go to a funeral themselves. You may remember that uh, the high priest... Uh, Aaron was going through his dedication ceremony when his two sons screwed up and got executed by God, and he was not allowed to do any type of ceremonies on their behalf. He could grieve in his heart, but not do a funeral service or uh, go to their funeral service. Uh, But the priests generally are said to not be able to do funerals for anyone except close relatives. This was another reminder that they represented God at a very high standard to the people. Now, after he's become clean, he shall count seven days for him. That's the idea of after a funeral, then he goes through the ceremonial uh, cleansing with the washing, and then it's seven more days before he can go back to his full duty as a priest. Verse 27, on the day that he goes into the holy place, into the inner court to minister into the holy place, he shall offer his sin offering, declares he who is God. Uh, So even the priests were supposed to offer sacrifices on their behalf because they needed to be right with God in order to help others get right with God. Now, there's some symbolic uh, applications here for preachers. Preachers need to be above reproach. They need to set a high standard and high example for everyone else. And uh, so we, we who are preachers have got to keep that in mind at all times that people are, are watching us and uh, they will take their cues from us as to what they should be able to do. And so all of us preachers, uh, I know it's like living in a fishbowl, but that comes with the territory. Verse 28, This shall be their inheritance. I am their inheritance. And you shall give them no possession in Israel. Now that's as in no no land specifically. Uh, That was true back in the time of Joshua. They were not given a specific land territory. They were given places inside all the different tribal territories. Well, we're about to find out in this section later that God is going to divide up the land differently to the 12 tribes of Israel. And the Levitical tribe will not be given uh, a specific territory other than that which is near 
the temple complex. They'll be given places there. Uh, so that hasn't changed. I am their possession. So God is going to be the one that takes care of them. They shall eat the grain offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, and every devoted thing in Israel shall be theirs. And uh, the first of all the first fruits of all kinds, every offering of all kind that is all your offering shall belong to the priests. You shall give to the priests the first of your dough that a blessing may rest on your house. Uh, that doesn't change either. Uh, Old Testament law said that the priests and the Levites got their living out of the offerings given by the other tribes. And so they were supported through the worship ceremonies and the giving of the tithe to God. And a very similar thing happens in the modern-day church. Uh, those of us who work full-time in ministry, we are paid out of the tithes given by everybody else uh, that is a member of the church. Uh, if the tithe is not given, then we can't get paid. So I appreciate it very much if you will make sure that your preachers can preach and teach and minister uh, by giving your tithes into the church out of which their salaries come. Verse 31, one last thing about food. The priest shall not eat of anything, whether bird or beast, that is died of itself or is torn by wild animals. The Israeli people were basically told that they were supposed to only eat food freshly killed, as in, you slit its throat, you bled it out properly. However, God made an exception for some Israelis thinking probably about poorer people, that if you find one of your animals has died overnight, you may butcher it out and, uh, you know, go ahead and eat that meat, but you have to count yourself as unclean for a while. If you find one of your animals has been attacked and killed by a wild animal, you can also eat that animal, if it's a fresh kill, uh, provided you understand that you have to go through a ceremony of cleansing afterwards. So that was an exception to the general rule, which Israelis could do. This is a reminder that priests are not allowed that exception. They, if they were to find a, an animal, one of their animals freshly killed, or find one of their animals freshly died, they can't do that. Uh, they'd have to give it to somebody else. Chapter 45. When you allot the land as an inheritance, so they're coming back into the promised land out of exile, and the original idea given by God through Ezekiel is that they're going to divide the promised land up over again, just like happened in the days of Joshua, back at the beginning of their history. And this time, though, uh, it's going to be a much more... Um, I'm trying to think how to describe it. Uh, it's going to be a much more measured dividing of the land. Uh, you might remember that they went out in those days and surveyed the land and then had markers that they put up based on geographical uh, indicators. And then those lands were divided up by lot. Well, this time we're going to find out we have the general borders given, and then they just divided up into linear sections from the north to the south. Uh, given to the different tribes. Uh, so when you do this, you shall set aside for he who is a portion of the land as a holy district. So there's going to be a specific holy section that is not counted as a tribal area. This is going to be the worship area. It'll be 25,000 cubits long. And by the way, long here means east and west. 25,000 cubits uh, translates into eight 
8.17 miles. So it's going to be 8.17 miles east and west. And 20,000 cubits, and hopefully you have a footnote here uh, that lets you know that the Hebrew actually says 10,000 cubits here. And if you see in the rest of this section, that's actually what shows up everywhere else. So I think it is 10,000 cubits. And so 10,000 cubits broad is going to be 3.27 miles north and south. So that's going to be the holy area where the temple is going to be located. It shall be holy throughout its whole extent. Of this, a square plot of 500 by 500 cubits shall be for the sanctuary. So that's 862 and a half feet squared. Uh, and 50 cubits for an open space around it. And so 50 cubits is uh, 86 feet 3 inches. Uh, so that's a perimeter around it. Uh, in which uh, that's where the, the sanctuary and the courtyards are going to be located. Uh, from this measured district, you shall measure off a section 25,000 cubits long, 10,000 cubits broad, in which shall be the sanctuary of the most holy place. That's actually a repeat in the material we just read. It shall be the holy portion of the land. It shall be for the priests who minister in the sanctuary and approach he who is to minister to him. And it shall be a place for their houses and a holy place for the sanctuary. So this is where the priestly district is going to be located, right around the sanctuary. Another section, 25,000 cubits long and 10,000 cubits broad, shall be for the Levites who minister at the temple as their possession, so the support personnel. And alongside that portion set apart as the holy district, you shall assign for the property of the city an area 5,000 cubits broad, so that's 1.63 miles, 25,000 thousand cubits long uh, that's at eight miles again and it shall be to the whole house of israel that's the general population area of jerusalem in this new place of god's people 